Good morning and welcome. First of all, a welcome to Sue Sunderland, who you all know, and um, thank you, Sue. And a reminder that there is a bowl for offerings in the crush hall, and um, for on your way in or on your way out. And also, just an explanation: we're still not serving coffees, but we do hope to at some point in the not too distant future. Janice and Tony Wells want to say a very big thank you to everyone who supported them at Mill and Coffee Morning and Afternoon last Wednesday. They raised £465. <laughs> There's a notice in the crush hall about the ladies' group, so I won't tell you what's on it. On Sunday, the 24th of October, Mary Paulson and hopefully others will be serving refreshments for the bike race at the Imperial Rooms between 9 and 5 p.m. Please can people donate homemade cake, there's a freezer downstairs, and also Mary would like offers of help. I hope some of you have offered already. There'll be no Zoom prayer meeting this week, October the 13th. Not entirely because it's my birthday, but partly that. But there will be the usual Zoom coffee morning at half past 10 on Thursday. And the next messy church will be held at 4 p.m. on Sunday, November the 7th. And now shall we pray. Dear God, please help us to truly worship you this morning. Please bless Sue as she leads our service. And please equip us to be your welcome to others. Help us to be outward facing and channels of your grace to everyone we see this week. In the name of Jesus, amen. Good morning, everybody. It's really nice to be here. Sorry I've not been for a few weeks, and uh, it's coming to something when putting me on the plans, the only way to get me to my own church, isn't it? But it's lovely to be here. And I'd like to start our worship this morning with an extract from Psalm 90, read from the message. Oh, teach us to live well. Teach us to live wisely and well. Let your servants see what you are best at, the ways you rule and bless your children. And let the loveliness of our Lord and God rest on us, confirming the work that we do, Oh yes, affirm the work that we do. And that's the challenge for us this morning. How can we live wisely and well? We're going to start by singing a hymn that is probably new to you, but I think it's quite a good, fun one that fits very well with our reading this morning. It's called A Rich Young Man Came Seeking. And uh, I think you'll find the tune easy to pick up, even if it's a little bit unusual to you at the first. So it's number 243, A Rich Young Man Came Seeking. I want us to start off by thinking about things that are precious to us. I'm going to go and ask Maisie if there's anything particularly that she has that's precious. And I'm going to take one of my precious things up to show her. But I'll show the rest of them at the front so as everybody can see them. This, Maisie, is the teddy bear that I was given when I was a very, very little girl, even smaller than you. And when I first got him, he had lots of lovely fur. And now if you look at him, he looks a bit bald, doesn't he? But he's still very cuddly. And he's been cuddled lots, which is why he lost all his fur. Have you got anything that's really precious to you? Um, um, Have you got any favourite toys? toys? I know you've got lots of cuddly toys because I've seen them on the, t on the TV screen. Um, my... Uh, you've got too many to choose from, haven't <laughs> you? I think it's... Pick one name. Hmm. Hey, 
sequin. Ah, right. That's great, isn't it? And I bet the rest of you have got things that are precious to you. They might not be cuddly toys. One of the other things that's very precious to me is this very small necklace that I wear almost all the time, unless I'm wearing something else for special occasions. In fact, I wear it so often that when I missed wearing it for work once, one of the men that I work with went, where's your necklace, Sue? But this necklace was the first thing that Phil, my husband, ever gave me. So it's, I like it because it's Blue John, but what really makes it precious is the fact that Phil gave it to me. Something else that's very precious to me, which might be a bit odd, is my iPad. Not perhaps for the reason you think, not because it gives me lots of internet access, but because it's got lots and lots of photographs on it. And those photographs are really precious to me because they record lots of happy memories of things with our family, things from holidays, all sorts of things. And so if there was ever a fire, I think my iPod would be something I'd rush to pick up on my way out of the house. And then finally, I've got my Bible. And it's not just any old Bible, this. It might look like it's in very good nick, and it's because I look after it. But this is the Bible that I was given when I became a local preacher. And so that makes it particularly precious to me. I'd be very loath to lose any of these four things that are really precious. Not because of their monetary value, but because of what they mean to me. But I hope that if I had to, if I was asked to by Jesus to give them up, if somebody needed them more than I do, that I'd be willing to do it. And in that song that we sang, there were quite a few examples of people that Jesus asked to give up things, or where he watched people giving up things, that actually were quite hard for them to do. The young boy gave his small lunch up, which enabled Jesus to feed 5,000 people. And Jesus commented very clearly about the difference between the scribe who'd given a little bit of money out of his wealth and the old lady, the widow, who'd given more than she could really afford and then we also heard about the rich young ruler who really wanted to follow Jesus, but he struggled to do what Jesus asked him to do, to give up his possessions. And we're going to hear more about him later. But the thing that all these stories have in common is that the pe it's about how the people treated their possessions and whether they were willing to be generous and give them up and now we're going to have a short prayer asking us, asking God to help us be generous with our possessions. So let's pray. Dear God, we all have favourite possessions, things that mean a lot to us. We ask you, Lord, to help us share them with you, to help us share them with others as you have shared so many good things with us. Amen. And now we're going to say some more prayers. Loving God, you've given us more good things than we need. Help us to share them with others who have less. You've given us families and friends and neighbours to care for us. Help us to show love for those who are unhappy or alone. You have given us different gifts and talents and many opportunities to learn. Help us to use them creatively to make your world a richer and lovelier place. You have given us freedom to live how we choose. Help us to use that freedom wisely for those deprived of basic human needs and rights. And Lord, forgive us when we've made treasures out of trinkets. 
Forgive us when we've clung to possessions as if they define us, as if we find our worth in them, whether we do this consciously or not. Forgive us when we treat luxuries as necessities and neglect to thank the giver for all that is provided for us. We confess that we often hold too tightly to material things. We understand too well the lure of riches, seeking our security in things other than you. Forgive us, God of the poor, when we close our eyes to the needs of others because we are too comfortable and do not like to be made uncomfortable. Rearrange our priorities when they've become skewed. May we treat what we have as a gift, not as our right, and not allow our possessions to become our possessors. Help us rather to find our treasure in you. For Jesus' sake, amen. And let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We're going to sing again. This time it's number 673. Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? We're now going to have our Bible readings, and you won't be surprised to know that the Gospel reading from Mark is about Jesus' encounter with the rich young man. It's a familiar story, and I've set Sheila a really interesting challenge. She's going to read this passage to you as there is a video played to give you some illustrations of this behind her. Chapter 10, verses 17 to 31, the rich man. As Jesus was starting on his way again, a man ran up, knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to receive eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not commit murder, do not commit adultery, do not accuse anyone falsely, do not cheat, respect your father and your mother. Teacher, the man said, ever since I was young I've obeyed all these commandments. Jesus looked straight at him with love and said, you need only one thing. Go and sell all you have and give the money to the poor and you will have riches in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the man heard this, gloom spread over his face and he went away sad because he was very rich. Jesus looked around at his disciples and said to them, How hard will it be for rich people to enter the kingdom of God? The disciples were shocked at these words, but Jesus went on to say, My children, how hard is it, it is to enter the kingdom of God? It is much harder for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. At this, his disciples were completely amazed and asked one another, who then can be saved? Jesus looked straight at them and answered, This is impossible for man, but not for God. Everything is possible for God. Then Peter spoke up, Look, we have left everything and followed you. 
Yes, Jesus said to them, and I tell you that anyone who leaves home, or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or feels for me and for the gospel, will receive much more in this present age. He will receive a hundred times more houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields, and persecutions as well. And in the age to come, he will receive eternal life. But for many who are now are first will be last, and many who now are last will be first. The second reading is taken from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 to 16. The word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It cuts all the way through to where soul and spirit meet, to where joints and marrow come together. It judges the desires and thoughts of man's heart. There is nothing that can be hidden from God. Everything in all creation is exposed and lies open before his eyes, and it is to him that we must all give an account of ourselves. Let us then hold firmly to the faith we profess, for we have a great high priest who has gone into the very presence of God, Jesus, the Son of God. Our high priest is not one who cannot feel sympathy for our weaknesses. On the contrary, we have a high priest who was tempted in every way that we are, but did not sin. Let us have confidence then and approach God's throne where there is grace. There we will receive mercy and find grace to help us just when we need it. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Sheila. So, is God only interested in how we manage our wealth? Does that mean if I'm not rich, I can just sit back and relax while Sue talks to everybody else in the congregation who's more wealthy than me? Well, I'm sorry, but no. You can't, or rather, you shouldn't, for two reasons. Firstly, by many of the world's standards, we're all rich. And we may benefit a little bit from thinking about how we use our money, but actually that isn't the main focus of what I want to talk about this morning. And secondly, whilst it was the young man's wealth that was holding him back, what it might be that's holding us back from fully committing to Jesus could be something completely different. So I think there's quite a bit that we can all take from this passage. To start with, the young man was enthusiastic to follow Jesus. He recognised something special about him, came up to him calling him good teacher. This was something that Jesus challenged, saying that only God was good. And Jesus then went on to question the young man about how well he kept the commandments focusing particularly on those commandments that related to human relationships. One commentary suggests that young, the young man recognised that he understood that obeying the letter of the law was not enough, and he was trying to obey the spirit as well as the letter, which was a lesson that many of the Pharisees hadn't learned. So actually he was a long way along the path of being a follower. And Jesus could obviously see the sincerity of the young man's answer. As verse 21 put it, he looked straight at him with love and said, and here comes the killer challenge. You need only one thing. Go and sell all you have and give the money to the poor and you will have riches in heaven. Then come and follow me. So what does that mean for us? Do we need to sell all we have in order to follow Jesus? I don't think it's as straightforward as that. It could be easy to see this as a tirade against people with money. 
Yet Jesus and the disciples were far from poor. Jesus himself came from what we might call a middle-class background. His father ran his own business at a time when construction was booming. And so the instruction to this particular individual must have been specific to his particular circumstances rather than a blanket statement about money. I think it means that Jesus loves us enough not to overlook the things that are getting in the way of a full 100% commitment to follow him. And what's more, he knows exactly what those things are that are holding us back. In the young man's case, it was his riches. In ours, what? Our career, our family, our friends, our standing in the community, our possessions. It could be anything. It could be a variety of things that are competing on making competing demands on our time. For me, I think the biggest thing is time. And I can be quite selfish with my time. I'm busy with a whole host of things, including work, church, and other commitments. And I like to, and do, spend time with family and friends doing things that I enjoy. When it comes to things that I don't enjoy very much, well, I can sometimes be quite ruthless or evasive. You may have experienced this side of me, and if so, I apologise. Church council meetings certainly fall into this category, and I only come because I have to. When I'm busy and tired, God also gets shortchanged. Lots of grumbling prayers, but no real quality time. So for me, giving up time has been part of the challenge in responding to God's call around local preaching. I have to give him more of my time, and it has to be quality time. If this is what I'm meant to be doing, I want to do it well. That's part of who I am. And I can't do it on my own, so I need to spend more time with God. Even a few years in, it takes me a long time to prepare for services. Fortunately, I enjoy it. I thought it might get quicker, but so far it hasn't. And in some ways, I find that odd, because if I was preparing something for work, I would easily gather all the facts, knock up a presentation, and present it, and it would be good. It's what I do. It would be accurate, detailed, and well presented. So why does preparing for a service take me so long? And I've been thinking about that as I prepared for this morning's service, and I think it's actually God's way of making me spend more quality time with him. If so, it's working. Because while I'm preparing for a service, I'm studying my Bible more. I'm looking deeper into the context behind it to make sure I'm not misinterpreting it, or even worse, adding my own interpretation to what God is saying through his word. I'm praying more and more deeply, looking outwards more, less about what I need and more about others. I'm listening to what God is trying to say to me, and I'm more open to trying different ways of sharing the good news about Jesus. But at the end of it, I know that if you find either a challenge or a blessing from my services, that is 100% down to God. I now need to extend that practice to the rest of my life, and regular time spent with God needs to become the norm. He does, however, still get fairly short shrift at times because that's just how I'm doing. It's work in progress and it's taking me time to get there. For the young man, the challenge Jesus presented was too great and he went away sad. 
We don't hear about how Jesus felt, but I guess he was sad too. What we do hear is how Jesus turned this into an opportunity to talk to his wider audience about how difficult it is for people, initially rich people, but subsequently extended to all people, to enter the kingdom of God. As verse 27 clarified, it is impossible for man, but not for God. Everything is possible for God. And that takes us to our second reading from Hebrews. In some ways, it's a bit of an odd reading as it seems to bridge two different parts of the letter together. The first bit is a concluding reflection on the faithfulness and mercy of God focusing on the power of God's word, which is described as something living and active, able to judge the workings of the human heart and from which nothing is hidden. And the first bit ends with a recognition that we all have to give an account of ourselves. When I was young, I used to find the concept that God knew everything about me quite scary particularly the bit about him knowing our thoughts as well as our actions. It was a bit like being threatened with a Santa cam, which seems to be all the rage at the minute. And we actually use the camera here in church, telling our grandchildren that that was a Santa cam when we had Alice's wedding so that they would behave. That's not to say that when I was young, I was a young thug. I, but I knew that whilst I could behave like a little angel when it re was required and in public, I could be quite different in private, particularly when I was on my own with my brother. And some of my thoughts and actions against my brother were far from angelic. Unfortunately, in some ways, I've not completely changed. Ask Phil if you don't believe me. However, I'm no longer scared about the fact that God knows all of this. Why? On reflection, I think there are two reasons. The first was brought home to me when I was reading my daily readings a little while ago, when it was, which was focused on Revelation. It's a book I find very difficult, but the writer made the point one day that often our relationship with God focuses on God's tender love and how that makes us feel. The writer confirmed that there's nothing wrong with that as long as we don't lose sight of God's power and glory. And Revelation is full of God's power and glory, something that is totally consuming and overwhelming. And it made me realise that I need to spend more time reflecting on this aspect and worshipping God for who he is. It might be the same for you. But it put me into perspective. I'm not that important. Secondly, I lost my fear because I now understand that even though God knows exactly what I'm like, he still loves me. That doesn't mean that he likes some of the things I think and say and do. And so his challenge to me is about dealing with these things. He also knows that I can't deal with them on my own. I need his help if I'm to succeed. So what I need to do is recognize what's holding me back and ask him to help me let it go. I think that's what we all need. Let's pray. Challenge me, God, where I have made too much of the things in my life, where I have hankered for what does not satisfy and hoarded what is not important. Give me a new perspective. Help me to let go of that which has had too much of a hold on me and instead focus my heart on you. In Jesus' name, Amen. And with that prayer in mind, let's sing our next hymn. Number 566, Take My Life and Let It Be.
consecrated, Lord, to thee. And now let's pray for the needs of others. Lord, may your wisdom shape our choices. We bring to you the fuel crisis, the disruption of supplies and services, the fear of empty shelves in shops, the shortage of drivers for trucks. And we pray for the government and all decision makers. May your wisdom shape their choices. We bring to you the police and criminal justice system and those whose confidence in the police has been shaken. We pray for those who seek to restore faith in an organisation and its people who are supposed to offer security and protection. May your wisdom shape their choices. We bring to you the NHS and all who work for it. We pray especially for those facing difficult decisions concerning appropriate treatments, the safety of staff, and all matters concerning COVID-19. May your wisdom shape their choices. We bring to you the church throughout the world different traditions and different denominations. We pray for those who seek to guide the mission of the church, that your word may be spread and your work done in all places. We bring to you those who are challenged by lack of resources to achieve their vision of your kingdom. And Lord, we pray for our church. We pray, Lord, that we will have a clear vision and the people willing to help bring that into being. Lord, may your wisdom shape our choices. We bring to you all those who face difficult choices, those without enough money for the essentials of life, those facing decisions about medical treatment or concerns about housing. We pray that they may find the help and support that they need in their communities. May your wisdom shape their choices. Lord, as we bring all these things, including all the world, to you, we know that there is much that needs doing. We're reminded today that, first of all, the key thing is our relationship with you. Wisdom comes from you, and by your Spirit you guide and strengthen us. You show us the path and help us to make the right decisions. We recognise that all things are possible with you, and that without you we can achieve very little. So, loving God, we pray that your wisdom will shape our choices. To the sick bring healing, to the sorrowful bring comfort, to the despairing bring hope, and to us bring vision, wisdom, and a knowledge of your purposes. In the name of Jesus, amen. And let's share in the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. <laughs>